Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining me. This is Bill Van Orsdell from WaveCloud with our Wednesday webinar, Increase Your Success by Thinking Like a Publisher. Thanks, everybody, for joining me tonight. Um, before we get started, I would like if someone could just, in maybe in the questions box, just send me a quick note. Uh, let me know you can hear me and that you can see my screens changing. I'd appreciate it very much. I just want to make sure that I'm actually live with the audience. Okay, fantastic, Lori. Thank you very much for responding. I was getting worried there for a moment, um, but you can see my slides and you can hear me. Thank you very much. Okay, before we get started, I want to let everybody know that I'm recording this for playback later. Uh, there are people that sign up and they can't they can't see it. There are people that come and they can't see through the whole thing. I want to let you know we're going to be publishing uh, the video of the slides with the audio, uh, and you'll get that link in the email. It'll probably go out around midnight tonight, um, so that if you'd like to watch it later or refer someone else, you're welcome to do so. Also, I am happy to share these slides with anyone who'd like them. Just send me an email to bill.vanorsdale at wavecloud.com, and I'll flip you back a set of the slides. Also, let's just sort of check our assumptions real quick for tonight's webinar. I'm assuming that you're planning to self-publish your book, that um, you've already made the decision, and, and it's not an easy one, frankly, uh, about whether you want to spend time querying an agent and having that agent try to find a publisher who will take your book on and pay for all of this stuff themselves and publish it, or uh, you've already made that decision that you want to forego that and you're going to self-publish your own book. Um, I want to tell you that most of the stuff I'm going to be talking tonight is good for fiction authors. There would be more detail I would give for non-fiction authors, and there'll be a couple points along the way where I'll just sort of digress from the slides or head off in a tangent and talk a little bit about what you might do differently here if you were a non-fiction author. But once you get past production, and you're into the marketing phase of your uh, book's life cycle, nonfiction definitely has a different approach than fiction. And when you're thinking like a publisher and you're, you're doing a business plan, that's important to remember. I'm also going to assume that you are going to approach this as a business and that we're going to talk about that taboo thing called money. And so uh, we might get into the zone of discomfort here, um, uh, but I think it's important because... Uh, frankly, publishers are thinking about money. They're, for the most part, they're in it to make money, and you need to understand that because that's the competitive framework that you're operating in. But we're not going to be talking about setting up a business, setting up a publisher. You know, should I be an LLC? Should I be a sole proprietorship? Should I incorporate? You know, how, what software should I use to manage my taxes? What's, what can I write off or not? Because that's not really the key elements for thinking like a publisher. That's really the thing, key things for thinking like a small business. And there's advice, there's tons of advice out there about that, and I don't need to repeat any of that stuff. But what I really want to zone in on or, or zoom in on is helping you all get into the mindset of, if you were a publisher, what would you be doing with this book or with this series of books? <clears throat> a quick word from our sponsor, that's WaveCloud. Um, this is not a sales pitch. I'm the, the chief marketing officer for WaveCloud. Um, this is not even a how to do, but this is a what to do, what to think about, to think how you can think like a publisher to increase your chances of success with your book. Yes, we are an author services platform. Yes, we've got some neat stuff coming out in the next couple of months, but I'm not going to talk about any of that tonight. Um, our goal is to help authors be successful, and if we can share good best practices information, we think that more authors can be successful, and that's what we want to see. So here's, I'm going to start off with the key points. And, and if, you know, once this slide's over, if you want to leave, you will have received all of the knowledge that I'm going to impart tonight. Yes, I'll go into some more detail about each of these points, and I'll get back to all, the, all of these at the end of the presentation. But I think I have your attention for probably about 30% of tonight's presentation, and we're in the, we're in the 30%. So number one, here's what we recommend. You must critically self-evaluate your book's prospects for success. There are a lot of books published every single day. Is your book, you have to ask yourself, is your book unique? Is What's compelling about it? Do you have an audience? Can you articulate who your audience is? Is it possible to even reach them with marketing? So you have to, you have to really look at not only is your book viable, but you also have to spend time thinking about do I want to do all the work? Am I capable of managing this process and this project of, of being a publisher and bringing a book to market? 
um, and, and working my way through all those key decision points and making the right decisions. Also, I think that you need to make a plan for your publishing business. Now, I, I don't want to say that you need to make a vision statement for your publishing business, but there are some key things that you need to be thinking about uh, both at the publisher level and at the book project level uh, as far as planning goes. Budgeting, sales projections. You need to understand sort of just the very basics at least what that looks like. Also, you have to produce at the highest quality levels that your budget allows you to. So, you know, normally if you're going to go to a publisher, they're going to pay you in advance, they're going to pay an editor, they're going to pay a book cover designer, they'll pe pay people to do your print layout, and, your, and they're going to spend money. They're going to spend $10,000, 20000 maybe $15,000. Big publishers will spend even more, especially when you count the, the, the amount that they spend for a, a, an initial print run and a, a sell-in of print, uh, print stock. So you have to think carefully about how to prioritize your budget, which is, I'm willing to, to bet, is going to be much lower than a traditional publisher would spend on your book. You know, you want to get in and get out of here for probably less than $6,000, less than $3,000 if you can. And that's not a lot of money to do a, a professional level job. So you have to carefully prioritize your spending. And because this is a business, um, you know, my final piece of advice, my final recommendation is you need to monitor, make adjustments, monitor, make adjustments. So you need to check your sales, you need to check your marketing, you need to look at your description, you need to play with your pricing. Publishing and even book management, book, book project management, once you get your book on the shelf, it's, publishing is a process. It goes on and on and on in a, in a continuous cycle of improvement. And, and within that cycle, you'll experience several book projects where you'll write a book and you'll bring it to market, you'll launch it, you'll market it, write a book, bring it to market, launch it, market it, and you'll just go through that series of steps over and over and over again in a repeating process. So, so let's talk about why this matters. Why should we bother to spend 43 minutes or 53 minutes or, or, or 57 minutes tonight talking about thinking like a publisher? Well, you have to understand that every single day in the United States, and you know, frankly, we could probably cut off the weekends and move all those books into the weekday, into the week, but, but on average, every single day, 365 days a year, 1,500 books are, are brought to market by traditional publishers alone. These are profit-seeking, experienced, professional organizations. These are the people that you're competing with. These are the people that have good-looking book descriptions with HTML embedded in them. These are the people that are buying um, promotional opportunities that, as self-published authors, we don't have access to yet on Amazon. These are the companies that are out there trying to grab more than their fair share of the market. So you are facing stiff competition. You, you not only do you have to have a good product, but it has to be packaged well. It has to be priced correctly. It has to be promoted correctly. Your goal is to be competitive and be profitable. Because being profitable means more budget to bring more books to market, more profit equals more books, more profit. It just, it's a, it's a self-reinforcing cycle. So um, I, I think this matters because there's a, there's a lot of competition. And sure, we've talked about the traditional competition. I bet there's another 500 to 1,000 books a day brought to market by self-published authors. So the, the sea that you swim in is probably actually bigger than the, the, all the books in, on this, in this picture alone every single day. Okay. So you probably remember the sorting hat from the Harry Potter series, if you saw that movie series. And um, you have to think for a moment like an acquiring editor about your book. And this is what they do. They put on the hat and they say to themselves, all right, this book, okay, well, is it unique? All right, so w what's an example of a unique book? Well, a great example is your memoir. Your memoir is unique because it's your life story and no one else has lived your life except you. Uh, Sci-fi adventure with space raccoons. That sounds relatively unique to me. I don't think I've ever read one of those. Um, uh, a uh, nonfiction book about how to do yoga on the high wire. I bet that's pretty unique. I, I don't know how many of those are in the market, although there's plenty of books about slackline yoga, for example. How about a book about the Vampire Academy? Whoops. I guess that one's already been done. So you have to be aware that, that, that um, you need to know your genre, you need to know your competition, because your agent does. And your agent's thinking about this when they think about thinking about how to sell your book. So again, if you're thinking like a publisher, part of, part of what you got to do is think about an agent. Think, think like an agent. How do they 
evaluate books, whether, whether they think it's worth their time, for which they get paid nothing unless a book gets sold, is it, it's worth their time to take your book and try and sell it to a publisher. What is compelling about your book? What is it about your story? So uh, I'll give you an excellent example. Let's say you've got a book about how to lose 40 pounds in 40 days. Okay, I bet that there are a couple of books out there already on how to lose weight. There has to be something compelling, something very unique about your book. Maybe it's on the beet diet or the potato diet or the water diet, whatever it is. But the key, one of the key questions that you need to ask yourself about your book is, will it generate positive word of mouth? Will people read this book and want to tell others about it? Positive word of mouth is the number one referral tool, although, the, although it doesn't account for the majority of referrals because the market's too fragmented. But it's the number one identifiable referral tool for how people find out about new books. Talking about how people find out about new books, one of the questions you have to ask yourself as a publisher is, is there an audience for my book? Is there, are there people out there who actually want to lose weight or learn how to do yoga on the high wire or read about space raccoons? Right? Who is the audience for this book? And I'll, I'll talk in some detail about how to get very specific about the audience for my book. But, but you should be thinking critically about who your audience is. And then, by the way, since, since you're going to be doing all the marketing, and that would be the case anyway if you went the traditional publishing route, you'd still be doing all the marketing. You have to ask yourself, how will I reach this audience? Can I reach them? Is it possible to identify people that like to, to read about um, furry rodents uh, as a spacefaring species? Right? How do I even pull those people out of the air and talk to them about uh, how great my new book is? Um, that's something you have to think very critical about, critically about. Um, and at the end of this, I'm going to give you a bunch of resources. Some of them are uh, book proposal resources, and it's not because I want you to necessarily write yourself a book proposal for your book, but I want you to get in some more detail and some more depth about what exactly do publishers and agents, what are they thinking about when they are um, evaluating your book and frankly, it's the same kind of stuff that we all need to think about when we're trying to bring a book to market. So defining the target readers. Who exactly are your target readers? Well, it's not everyone. Not everyone is going to enjoy reading your book. Not everyone enjoys reading every any book. I mean, it, you, you'd have to pick one out. Fifty Shades of Grey, the Quran, uh, the Bible. You know, last year or maybe it was the year before last, Fifty Shades of Grey accounted for, I think, one in every five books sold in the United States. One of the three books in the trilogy sold, accounted for like 20% of every book sold in the United States. Every single employee at Random House got a $5,000 bonus because of that book. But I guarantee you that not everyone in America read it. So the point is, you've got to zoom in on who your target audience is. You've got to go down to the micro level. So I'll give you an example. I was talking to an author the other day, and they said, hey, I've got a book about sports. Oh, really? What, well, tell me about it. Oh, yeah, well, I've got, I've got a great book about tennis. Oh, so, it, so it's actually a book that people who like tennis would like to read. Well, actually, it's a book about how to play tennis. Okay, so your target audience is people who play tennis. Well, actually, my book is designed for um, lefties. And I'm actually targeting high school, uh, high school left-handed high school players because there's some things they need to know. It'll help them be better. Okay, so your book is for left-handed high school tennis players. I got it. It's actually for left-handed high school tennis players that want to improve their game on grass, right? You can see you see where I'm going with this. You can keep drilling down into more and more and more narrow niches for your book, and at some point you say, okay, that's far enough because how would I address that niche? But you've got to get to a level where you can identify the market and you can connect with it. So not everyone is a, is a candidate for your book. And you need to be very specific with yourself, the same way you'd have to be specific with an agent or a publisher about who exactly is the target for my book. And how many of them are there out there? How many, how many left-handed high school tennis players are there? I don't know. Um, but you should know before you write the book or before you go about marketing the book or identifying your target market. And by the way, of all of those left-handed high school tennis players, how do I reach them? Is there a left-handed high school tennis player association? Uh, do they all read a certain magazine? Do they all follow a certain Facebook page? Are they all in the same LinkedIn group or the same Facebook page? So how many of those of your target audience can you actually communicate with? And then, by the way, because hopefully you're doing this already, how many readers are you already connected with? So you've got the addressable market, and there's some segment of those that you already know. 
because you've gone to that community, you have engaged with that community, maybe it's a cancer survivor's community, maybe it's a science fiction lover's community, maybe it's people who like to read first contact books or space opera or alien invasion books. Uh, maybe you are uh, big into steampunk or maybe you write um, Regency romance novels, costume pieces or Victorian era romance novels and you know the, 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 where those cosplay events are, you know where those book readings are, you know who the top so you know who those people are and you've started to connect with some of them already. And how then you have to ask yourself, how will you connect with the rest? You know, most authors don't think about these things. They think about, hey, I'm going to write the book of my heart. I, this is, I'm, not a, I'm not writing for commercial reasons. I'm writing the book I want to write. And I say write the book you want to write. But understand while you're writing it who you're writing it for. Who is your target market? Who, is, who if you're thinking about uh, doing this as a publisher, you have to know who these people are. Let's talk for a minute about profit. It's kind of the taboo money thing. I mean, I talk to a lot of authors, and uh, I ask them what their goal is, and they'll tell me, well, I, you know, I think um, if I could get this, this book in front of more troubled young women, um, I could keep a lot of them out of jail because they could learn from all the mistakes that I've made. Or if I could get this uh, book in front of more people who suffer from osteoarthritis, uh, I think I could give them some tips on how to uh, live a better life. And they would, I would really be helping the world if I did that. Those are all laudable goals. They're fantastic goals. I always ask my authors, please add another goal to that list. And that goal is earning out. I want you to think about how you're going to earn out against all the expenses that you're going to spend editing, producing, and marketing this book. So let's talk about those. We'll actually get to a, a, a sort of an imaginary book in just a moment. But... The first thing you have to do when you're thinking about like a publisher is you have to estimate how many books am I going to sell in my first year? Am I going to sell 500? Am I going to sell 5,000? What is a reasonable number for me to shoot for, uh, for the number of books that I think I'll sell? You have to come up with this number yourself. There's no magic formula or calculator or somewhere you can go on the web that's going to tell you. The only statistic that matters in this one that you need to know about is most self-published authors who probably don't think like publishers, who aren't out investigating the market and trying to figure out how to make this work, most self-published authors sell less than 100 books. So if you're the self-published author that's not going to learn how to think like a publisher, not going to do a job, a professional level job of bringing their book to market, you should project selling about 100 books. And you know maybe you'll, you'll, you'll hope or pray for more. But if you are going to take a professional approach, then you should set yourself a target, a real estimate. You have to think about how much money am I going to make per book. So if you're not already familiar with the way the royalty system works at Amazon and Barnes and & Noble and Kobo and Apple and the Google Play Store, you need to go and get familiar. You need to know that in the Amazon bookstore, if you price your book between $2.99 and $9.99, you make a 70% royalty. If you price it at $0.99, cents, you only make a 35% royalty. If you pay it over $10, bucks, you make a 35% royalty because that factors into your projections about how much you're going to make per book. When you load your print-on-demand book into the CreateSpace system so that it shows up on the Amazon page, and when you, lower it, when you load it into Lightning Source, you need to understand what is Lightning Source and what is uh, CreateSpace going to charge you every time they sell one of your books relative to your price. So how much money will you make? You, then you need to ask yourself, okay, well, 75% of my book sales will be ebook and 25% will be print. Or 95% of my book sales will be ebooks and 5% will be print because you'll have a different margin. A different amount of money that you make on an ebook sale than on a print book sale, I guarantee you. So you take your estimated unit sales, you take your average revenue per book, you multiply them together, and that's your projected revenue. That's the money that you're hoping to make by selling a certain number of your copy of your books over the next 12 months. But now you have to wipe out all the costs. You have to subtract, if you will, all the costs from that revenue. And, of course, that includes an advance. Wait a minute, you're not going to pay yourself in advance, <laughs> I hope. Uh, if you are, save it for marketing later. Um, so no advance, but you're going to pay for editing. You're going to pay for production. You're going to pay for marketing. You're going to pay for overhead. We'll talk about overhead in a minute. Uh, editing, you know, I, I talk a lot to a lot of authors. And they say, well, do I really have to edit my book? And I say, of course you don't. Nobody's going to make you edit your book. In fact, to sell your first book, you probably don't have to edit it at all. But to sell your second and third and fourth and fifth books, you definitely want to have a high-quality edited product on the market. Here's why. Because if your first half dozen Amazon reviews say something like this, uh, I found uh, just five or six 
spelling and grammar errors uh, in the first chapter of the book. I couldn't read another chapter. I, it, it just blew it for me. This book needs to be edited. You get three or four or five reviews like that, you're going to have to pull your book from the market. You're probably going to have to change the ISBN. You might have to change the cover. You might have to change your author name. Or maybe you'll just put out a new edition that's been edited, and you'll waste a lot of time. You'll have those hanging negative reviews hanging against your, uh, against your book. So you want to get your book edited. You want to do a professional job of producing it, meaning to a high-level standards. You want to market it. I, I, I recommend all the authors I talk to, be careful how much money you want to spend marketing and don't spend a lot, especially on your first book. And I'll talk a bit more of that, about that in a little bit. And what I mean by overhead, <clears throat> well, of course, if, it's, if you're a publisher, you know, it's, the, it's the proverbial three martini lunch. It's the Manhattan address. It's the car service to get you home at night. I don't really believe any of those things. The people who tr tr traditionally publish books are just frugal, just like you and I are. And yeah, a lot of them work and live in New York, uh, but they're not making bank. Um, but the bottom line is that they do have overt expenses, and you will too. So if you have to pay a fee to your Secretary of State to incorporate your LLC, if you have to hire a bookkeeper for the year to help you make sure that you've kept your books properly, you've got all your expenses for your um, uh, publishing career matched properly against your revenues so that you don't pay too much in taxes. So there's always going to be overhead. Maybe you've got to buy a piece of software to help you edit uh, your, your manual before you send it out to a human editor. So there's always going to be some overhead costs. But the bottom line is that your projected revenue minus your projected cost is going to equal your profit, and that's what you need to know as a publisher. How much money am I going to make on this book? And then, by the way, if I'm going to do more than one book, how many am I going to do, and how much money will I make on each book? And what, is it, what does it look like on each successive year? So I'm going to slow down for a minute. I'm going to pop us up to the next slide in just a second. But if you've got questions, I want to encourage you to throw them up into the question box in the little interface there on the, on the webinar. I'll be happy to read them out and answer them, or you can tell me not to read them out if you'd like. Um, I love to do that. I love to get questions from the audience. It helps me feel like I'm connecting, even though I can't see you in person. And uh, I might throw out a term or, or recommend a website, and you want to know what it is. So please feel free at any time. Make this as interactive as you'd like. Stop me, throw up a question, and I'll, uh, I'll pause and answer it. Okay, so let's talk about a book. I don't know if it's about space raccoons or high-wire yoga, but uh, let's talk about some estimates for what this book looks like. So I'm going to estimate, I'm going to put in my plan that my space raccoon book is going to sell 6,000 copies, 6,000 units. And some percentage of those are going to be e-books. Some percentage of those will be my print-on-demand books. If I'm a public speaker, maybe some percentage of those will be the ones I sell at the back of the room on my next four speaking engagements. But I'm going to sell 6,000 units in the first 12 months. And by the way, if I'm going to sell all of those on Amazon, what kind of book rank do you think that 6,000 books in a year equals? Well, 6,000 books a year equals roughly 17 books per day, 168 per month, something like that. And short answer is that if, my, if I can keep my book at an Amazon sales rank in the paid bookstore at 4,000 or above for the whole year, I can do that. I can sell 17 books a day on average. I can sell 6,000 books for the year. So an Amazon sales rank of 4,000, how difficult is that? Well, the first thing you have to understand is it means you're one of the top 4,000 selling books on Amazon. And if you were to, for example, go take a look in Amazon, drill down into your genre. So maybe your genre is um, uh, Kindle eBooks, romance, uh, historical, histor historical romance. Uh, take a look at the bestsellers list, the top 100, and scroll down to number 100 in that list. And look at where they fall on the total Amazon sales rank system. And I bet you'd find, and I, because I did some research on this last night, that if you're number 100 in, in almost any of the major genres, and even in a couple of them, such as science fiction romance, down to a subgenre or a sub-subgenre, like, for example, uh, if you go to Kindle eBooks, science fiction and fantasy, science fiction, uh, military science fiction, and you go to book number 100 on the top uh, paid book list in that genre, and you go look at what their overall rank is in the store, they're probably, uh, they might be as low as 1,000. It might be as low as 900 or 400 even. It depends on the exact genre. But the point is, for that day anyway, they're way above 4,000. They are definitely selling more than 17 or so books per day. And so 
for them, for, for, for someone who's managing their book, thinking about a business plan, they'll probably make 6,000 unit sales today. By the way, where am I getting these numbers? So first of all, you have to understand Amazon doesn't share this information. But there have been a lot of authors that have been very kind to share this information on the web. Hey, when I hit so and so on the when I hit such and such rank on the uh, Amazon uh, book system, uh, I sold this many books that month. Or you know, my high rank and my low rank was X and Y, and I sold this many books. And they'll give you some data over a period of months. You've probably read it if you pay any attention to the blogosphere about authors and writing. You've probably heard about the AuthorEarnings.com website. Uh, recently put out by uh, Hugh Howey and uh, an unnamed uh, helper, a programmer, who went and scraped Amazon for one day in January. And they scraped the top, I think, 7,000 uh, odd bestsellers across the three or four best-selling fiction genres. And they used that to do some really interesting calculations about, does it make more sense to go traditional versus self-publishing? One of the side notes that I thought was very interesting in that website and that research and the commentary that Hugh makes is he talks about how he used his sales data and he had some other authors volunteer their sales data to help them understand what a rank of X means in terms of books sold per day. So some very helpful numbers out there that can help you do this forecast. Okay, so enough about forecasting how many books I'm going to sell for the year. Let's talk about what kind of uh, average royalty I'm going to receive. So I mentioned before that for uh, in, in the uh, 2 dollars to 9 dollars bracket, you're going to get a 70% royalty from Amazon. Uh, on a six ninety nine book, depending on how many page it is, uh, create space print on demand book, you'll probably pay roughly three eighty to get every time they sell one of that. So you'll take two sixty five. Right. Um, so if you blend those together, and I don't know if you blend them seventy five twenty five, eighty twenty, so fifty fifty. It depends on whether you're talking fiction or nonfiction. What does your genre look like? Um, you come up with an average net royalty to an author. And I just I kind of I said seventy five twenty five. So my calculation looks like this for this imaginary book about space raccoons. 6,000 units. $3.40 on average I'll earn per book. That means for the year on this book, I'll earn $15,900. Okay, that's not, that's not quite uh, poverty level in the United States, but it's a start. Uh, and you can imagine if I could actually do four books a year uh, and then do four books the next year and four books the next year. And if I could keep them, I don't know if I can keep them all up above 4,000 all the time, but you can see how you can start to make a living at this. But first, but then I have to, before I get really excited about making a living at this, living at this, I have to eliminate my cost, right? I have, to, I have to pay for all of that wonderful book production and that marketing and that editing. And I've got what I'd call sort of a middle of the road or maybe even a little high-end set of costs here. So if you want to edit a 100,000-word book and you need, you need uh, developmental editing, you need structural editing, you need line editing, you need proofing, you want all four passes, on your book, you're probably going to pay north of 2,500 bucks. But if you can do the line editing and do the, the proofreading yourself, and and you just need someone to help you with the developmental and the structural, you know, you might be able to get away with a $2,500 or maybe a $1,500 edit. It depends on the editor you've got, how hungry they are, uh, what exactly you want them to do, how clean is the manuscript when you send them. But you need to budget some money for editing. In this case, I budgeted $2,500. Production. What is production? Production is Making a killer book cover that doesn't just look good, but it sells books. All right, that's probably uh, I'll I'll throw a number out. It's if you do a print and an ebook cover, that's probably going to be somewhere between two hundred and uh, I I'd, I'd have a hard time seeing spending more than four hundred on it, but two hundred to four hundred dollars. Then you got to pay somebody to do your interior layout. You got to pay somebody to do your ebook conversion to prepare your print on demand files. Uh, maybe you're going to help get some help copywriting your book description. So I budgeted $1,000, which should be plenty for a very high level uh, of professionalism in the production of the product that you're actually going to sell in the bookstore. Then you've got marketing. I've actually got a pretty low marketing budget here, and that's because I would be nervous advising an author on a first book, especially a fiction author, to spend more than $1,000. And that's because, frankly, your portfolio, your engine, the thing against which you're marketing isn't big enough to do something with $1,500 worth of marketing. I tell all the authors I work with, don't hire a marketer uh, because, frankly, uh, you're going to be better off learning about how to do the marketing yourself, doing it yourself, figuring out what's effective and what's not, and saving your budget 
for the actual ads or the book bub placement. You know, rather than pay a marketing consultant $2,000 to spend $1,500 for you, better for you to save the $2,000, spend the $1,500 yourself, and learn about book marketing for your first book. There'll be money in your pocket when the second and third books come along. Overhead, I threw $500 in here. Maybe you want to have a lawyer take, at your LL, take a look at your LLC filing. Maybe you need to buy an online subscription to Quicken for your book business. For a total marketing cost, uh, a total, sorry, total cost of bringing this book to market, editing, production, marketing, overhead, $5,500. That means that in the first year in theory, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, have a net profit of $10,400. Okay, so, and then I just threw another number in here for fun. If I just wanted to break even, if I just wanted to make that $5,500 back, how many books do I have to sell? I probably have to sell about 2,100 books. Um, of, of just one of my books. So any questions about uh, profit by the numbers, I'm happy to talk about them before we go on. Otherwise, I'll just move on to the next slide. Okay, a business plan? Really? I didn't go to business school, so why am I creating a business plan? Well, I think uh, you may not necessarily need a, vision, a, a business plan with a vision statement and an org chart and an ownership structure and you may not actually need a 23-page written business plan for your new publishing business, although there are plenty of authors who've done it. There are authors who write big business plans and actually update them every quarter because it, it helps them stay on track. It helps them identify what their goals are, figure out what to prioritize, and keep pushing for that goal every 90 days. But there are some basics that you need to do that you would find in a business plan. And so if you're going to do them anyway, you might as well assemble them in a business plan. Let's talk about what those are. You've got to forecast, how many books a year am I going to write? What kind of budget do I have to invest in my business, to invest in the production costs, the editing costs, and the marketing costs of my book? Does my budget limit the number of books that I could actually bring to market in a year? Of course, until the books start paying for themselves. I need the book sales forecast that we just talked about before. Is it 2,000 books? Is it 3,000 books? Is it 6,000 books? Is it 100 books? What's my forecast for each of my book sales? I need to do some research. I need to do some competitive and target market research. I need to figure out, I need to know my genre forward and backwards. I need to know who my competing authors are. And by the way, the authors aren't really competing. There's more than enough space for more good books out there. It's really a question of discovery. But when I say competing, I mean your book has to look and be packaged and be presented in a way that looks professional. And so in, in, that, in that sense, you've got a set of competitors out there. How long does it take to get my book Finished, written, edited, produced. You know, what does my production timeline look like for the one, two, three, or four books that I'll write a year? And do I have a marketing plan? Do I have a marketing budget? How am I going to spend that $1,500 most effectively uh, when I launch my book? And when should I spend it? Let's take a look at a couple of these in a little more detail. So forecasting books, revenues, and costs, we talked about it. You know, you could do the back of the napkin approach, which is, of course, the little image that I've got here on the bottom right hand going to sit there and throw yourself a few squiggly lines that, you know, I'll get started and then I'll have some costs and books will go up, book sales will go up, they'll go down. But I think you've got to start with this concept of how many books will I bring to market each year? Do I write one book every 18 months? Do Am I a nonfiction author? Do I write, am I going to write one book and update it every single year? And basically my book is my calling card. I use it to get business, I use it to get speaking engagements, and I sell it at the back of the room or I sell it in bulk to the companies I companies or organizations I speak to. Or am I a, a nonfiction I mean am I a fiction writer? And I've learned that having a bigger portfolio lets me do a better job of marketing, gives me more options for sampling strategies and pricing strategies. And so I know that I need to get four books out as fast as I can. Four quality books, but I need to get four books out uh, absolutely as fast as I can. How much are you going to invest per book? Is it fifty five hundred dollars? Is that your budget? And how quickly can you do that? Do you have to wait for the first one to pay off before you can pay for the second one? These facts have to go into your business plan so you can think about what you're doing. Then, of course, we talked about how many books you'll sell. What's your, what's your individual sales forecast for each of these books you're going to bring to market? And by the way, while you're thinking about all this, you probably want to get a little sophisticated, throw up an Excel spreadsheet or, uh, or whatever spreadsheet you like to use. Maybe it's a Google, Google spreadsheet, which is free, and, and understand that the costs are going to come before the return. Right? So can I float $5,000 for six months until I make it back? And then once I've made it back in six months, can I then afford to reinvest that $5,000 in the next book, which should be hopefully at that point ready to go? 
And you have to understand, especially when you're doing your research, where am I going to price my book? Right? What's the net royalty that I expect to make per each book that I sell? That's pretty important to know when you're forecasting your books and your revenue and your costs. Let's talk a little more in detail about competitive and target market research. You know, if you're not already reading ebooks, um, then you need to. Because you'll, as a self-published author, unless you're in some specialized nonfiction markets, the majority of the books you're going to sell are going to be ebooks. If you don't know what an ebook is, you've never read one, you don't have an ebook reader, you don't have a tablet, you need to educate yourself. You need to understand what is that experience like of reading an ebook. And you don't have to go out and buy a tablet. If you've got a computer, which I assume you do since you're writing, you can install the Kindle Cloud Reader inside of Google. Uh, you can go get the Kindle uh, Previewer for free. You can go get the Adobe Digital Editions for free, and you can read EPUBs. There are plenty of ways for you to read an ebook that's in a Mobi or EPUB format, which is the way most people read ebooks. So you can get a feel for what that looks like. And then once you've established that Amazon account, because you're starting to look out there for books and understand, hey, what are my genres? What are the genres I compete in? One of the things you under need to understand is Amazon's concept of browse paths. So you and I call them a genre. So we'd say, all right, uh, genres sort of break down like this. There's fiction and there's nonfiction. And in nonfiction, you've got things like uh, 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 memoirs and biographies. You've got things like uh, textbooks. You've got things like uh, law books. You've got things like um, uh, how to be a better speaker, right, just for fun. In, not, in fiction books, you've got things like uh, juvenile books, kids' books. You've got uh, romance. You've got science fiction and fantasy, right? So as you proceed down each one of these paths, uh, each one of these genre trees, uh, inside the science fiction and fantasy tree, you would find science fiction and fantasy. Then inside the fiction branch, I'm sorry, inside the science fiction branch, you'd find a whole host of them. You'd find First Contact. You'd find Alien Invasion. You'd find Space Opera. You'd find... Um, You'd find romance. You'd find uh, time travel. You'd, there's a whole set of subgenres. You'd find steampunk. You'd find cyberpunk. And so you have to understand what do the browse paths look like in Amazon. And the reason you have to understand that is because your book is going to sit in one of those buckets. And even if you don't categorize it, Amazon will do it for you. And you want to categorize it. You want to be in charge of that. And so, first of all, you have to know where you want to go. And I'll tell you two secrets about this. And you'll figure out one of them, so it won't be a secret. It'd be pretty easy for you to figure out when you start doing the research. Amazon actually provides two different trees. So first of all, you have to log in to your Amazon account so you can see the numbers and see how it works. But once you've logged into your account, go to the books department and look at the, the, the browse path, the, the, the um, taxonomy tree, the genre tree, and drill down into it for where you think your book's going to go. Then open up another browser or another tab and go into the Kindle eBooks department and do the same drill down and see if at the end of that drill down you're left with the same set of options. In almost every single case, whether it's romance, science fiction, uh, fantasy, uh, thrillers, uh, self-help, um, memoirs, biographies, you'll find a different set of endpoints. So that means you need to be knowledgeable about both of them because you're going to put up an ebook and you're going to put up a print-on-demand book. You need to understand where, when asked, those two sets go. That's secret number one. Secret number two is, of course, you, you'll, you'll know this when you get there. First of all, you get to choose two browse paths for each format of your book. So your Kindle ebook gets two. Your print book, which will hopefully come from CreateSpace, gets two as well. Here's the thing you have to know. The... the the genre tree provided in the CreateSpace upload utility doesn't match the book taxonomy or book genre tree in the book department in Amazon. You'd think it would. You would think that they would match, but they don't match, even though CreateSpace is a subsidiary of Amazon. CreateSpace uses something called BISAC codes, B-I-S-A-C. I think it stands for Book Industry Study Something Something Classification. And the point is that... You need to understand what your two browse paths are in the book department for your book. And then once, you, once you've uploaded your book into CreateSpace, you literally need to email their support team with your two requested browse paths, and they will communicate it to Amazon for you, and your book will be in the right place. 
You can go ahead and select the brow the BISAC codes when you upload, but they won't match. They won't necessarily match what's in the Amazon. Not many people know that. Um, while you're doing this research into your genres and your genre tree and, your, and how this whole taxonomy thing works, you need to understand what are the genre norms. So things like what 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 do the book covers look like in my competitive in my uh, in the competitive books in my genre? Go look through the top 100 paid books and the top 100 free books in your genre in Amazon, and look what do all the cover designs look like? Do they have a common color palette? Do they have a common images? What, what, how long are those books? How many pages long are they? Now that's hard to know sometimes if a book's only as an ebook because ebooks don't necessarily have the concept of number of pages because you can change the font size. Um, uh, but but do what research you can and figure out what is it what does it sort of look like on average? What trim size? When you have to decide when you're doing your print on demand book in Create Space, you have to tell them what you want your trim size to be. Well, it would be good to know what the normal trim size is in my genre. So I can decide whether I want to stick with that trim size or bucket and go with something smaller or bigger. Of course, trim size is the physical dimensions of the front cover of your print book, usually, say, five and a quarter by eight or something like that. Also, when you start to research the top 100 paid and the top 100 free books in your target genre or genres, you need to go get familiar with those authors. You need to go to their anchor website. You need to go and see what they're doing on Goodreads. You need to figure out what are the com common promotional tools and activities done by those authors in the top 100 who I guarantee you are selling well more every single one of them than 17 books a day so they are definitely all uh, doing well in the store you, you would do well to figure out what are they doing and then uh, also give some thought to your target audience addressability so you've you've narrowed your target audience down to people who want to lose 40 pounds in 40 days or people who want to be read space opera about uh, a race of sentient cats, right? Figure out where those people are. Where are those readers? How will you address them? How will you market to them? How will you communicate to them to let them know that your book is available? Let's talk about production timelines. I talked earlier about how um, you know everybody proceeds at their own pace, but you need to know what your pace is. So I just put together a sample uh, timeline here. There's nothing set in stone. There's nothing fancy about this. Let's say it takes you four months to write your book. Maybe it takes you three months. Maybe it takes you two months. Maybe it takes a year and a half. But let's say it takes four months. You're going to spend maybe a month, maybe a couple of weeks self-editing that book. Then you're going to go get a professional edit. That's going to take time back and forth, back and forth, using the uh, using Microsoft Word and the the, uh, the the review capabilities in Microsoft Word. Then once your text is is literally word perfect. It's it's got every word in place and none that it doesn't need. Then you move into production. You're creating your book cover. You are creating your uh, ebook files. You're creating your print on demand files. Then you got to get that book loaded into all your distribution channels. You got to get loaded into Amazon, Barnes and Noble, Apple, Kobo, the Google Play Store. You got to get it up in Lightning Source. You got to get it up in uh, Create Space so that now your book is available for people to buy. And there are a lot of authors that go crazy at this point. They think, okay, I gotta, I'm in a hurry. I'm in a giant hurry. I've got to get this done right now. And they'll skip some steps. Or once they've got it up, their book page doesn't look good. They haven't got a good book description. The book description isn't laid out well. There's no HTML involved in it. It just sort of looks blah. And they now they're saying, okay, my book's up. I've got to start marketing it. I've got to start selling my book. This is absolutely important. I must do it right away. When what I recommend to them is, you know, take a couple weeks. Make sure Look Inside works. Make sure your book description is good. Double check your pricing across all of your channels. Make sure that your book sales page on Amazon, on Kobo, on Barnes & Noble is ready to receive the traffic that you're going to drive to it with your social marketing efforts and your paid marketing efforts. Make sure that you've got social proof. Make sure you've got enough reviews up there. And then, of course, once you're really ready, once you're done with your soft launch, everything looks good, then you want to go ahead and start your post-launch marketing. And that could be two weeks, two months, two tweets, two years. Uh, uh, it, it is essentially the marathon. It's, it's the last part of the triathlon. The first part of the triathlon is the swim. The second part, and that's where you write your book and you edit it. You edit it, and the second part of your triathlon is the production, where you create something that someone can actually buy in a store. That's your cycling. Well, the third leg of the, of the triathlon is your marathon. And it's not a race. Your book now, because it's up as an ebook and as a print-on-demand book, it's going to be up there for quite some time. 
So you don't have to uh, you don't have to worry about that uh, quite as much. Um, once you get it up there, it'll be up there forever. The idea is to keep driving traffic there little by little over time. This kind of production timeline and your marketing efforts will positively vary fiction versus nonfiction. Um, marketing especially is different for nonfiction books, and it's different depending on uh, what your book is for. You know, if your book's a memoir, if your book is a, a how-to, uh, and you're not, for example, using it as part of a speaking career, your marketing efforts are going to be different in shape and size and scope than they will be if this is a calling card for a speaking career, which is very common for nonfiction books. Let's talk about a sample marketing plan and a budget. Uh, you know, here's some ideas, and th please don't take this as the gospel for what Bill or WaveCloud thinks you need to do for marketing. Um, I'm just giving you some examples of, you know, what marketing might costs might look like. And by the way, you know, this is, uh, I think it's $3,800 worth of marketing, which is way over our budget for $1,500 worth of marketing for the launch of our book. Um, I've got everything in here from uh, create your author website with your own URL name that you own, right? It's it's uh, BillVanOrsdell.com. Right or it's it, but it's not uh, Bill Van Orsdell dot dot com. It's not Facebook slash Bill Van Orsdell because I don't own those URLs. And if Facebook decides they want to start advertising other books on my books Facebook page, or Blogspot decides they want to start throwing in ads on my Blogspot page, I don't control that. And so you want a place that you control, and that's what the anchor website is for. Not to say you can't use Facebook, LinkedIn. Pinterest, all those social media sites, but you need to have one place that you can call your own and control. You might want a, a paid professional review, which you know can take three to four months. So you got to plan that. A professional review, in my opinion, uh, is is uh, of questionable marketing value, but it depends. Depends on what your book is about. Depends on what your competitors are doing. When I talk about a paid professional review, I'm talking about Kirkus or PW or or uh, Blue Ink. Um, those are all uh, good providers. We've talked to them. And, and they do a good job of giving honest feedback for $500. Um, but the question is, does it sell books? You might want to send out advanced reader copies. Um, one of our authors uh, just had us send out on his behalf 10 advanced reader copies from his CreateSpace account. He shipped 10 of his paper books to reviewers, and it cost him some money uh, in, uh, in the, the printing and the, the postage costs. You might want to do a Goodreads ad or some giveaways. You might want to do BookBub. If you're not familiar with BookBub, you need to go take a look at it. Take a look at Pixel of Ink. Take a look at eBook Soda. There are ser these are services that tell readers that have signed up to be notified about book deals. So if you have a price promotion because it's Valentine's Day and your book is about how to be a better kisser, or it's Halloween and your book is about you know 14 easy at home scare the pants off of you recipes for your kids, your middle schoolers' uh, Halloween party, um, you know. If you're doing a price promotion and you want to tell people about it, BookBub and services like it can do it for you, but they're not inexpensive. A LinkedIn campaign, a Facebook campaign, a Google campaign, doing pay-per-click or promoted posts, that costs money. So, you know, have a, a marketing plan in mind uh, and a budget to go with it and have some limiters in place so it doesn't get crazy. All right, so we're on the final step, really, and that is, as I mentioned before, you know, you are a publisher. You're not just putting one book out there. Uh, you're probably not just putting one book out there. You're going to have multiple books eventually. And so you've got to keep an eye on, is your marketing working? Is your pay-per-click campaign working? What's the traffic to your Facebook? Are you gathering more or less users or followers on Twitter? Um, is, is the number of books that you're producing per year matching your business forecast? Are your sales meeting your forecast? Are you capturing daily numbers from Amazon? By the way, Amazon doesn't give daily numbers. The only way to get daily numbers from Amazon and all the other providers is to literally log on every single day and compare today's sales for this week to what the number was yesterday and subtract the second one from the first one so you know what you did overnight. So you log on every day at the same time and you compare your sales uh, yesterday to today and then you start capturing that in a spreadsheet. Every single day, by channel, uh, 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 by book format, here are the books that I sold, so that you can coordinate and understand and measure the effectiveness of your marketing. You know, it's great to go on a blog tour, but if you're measuring your daily sales and you don't see any blips from the blog tour, will you do a blog tour a second time? I hope not. Probably not. You probably won't. 
There are free marketing opportunities. You know, are those, are, do any of those come up? Have you missed any of those? Um, when you're doing price promotions, do they, do they generate revenue? Do they generate readers? These are all of the things that as a publisher, you're thinking about constantly while you have a book in the market. When you go to a publisher and, 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 and contract with them to publish your book for you, you know, you give them a very long tail or a long term asset. And they're working on it over time. And now that print on demand is so well accepted by the market, there's no reason for a book to go out of print. And uh, smart publishers are always thinking about how do I goose sales? How do I goose my backlist? How do I goose my midlist? And what they do is they monitor what's going on in the market and they adjust. One of my absolute favorite uh, bloggers in the book market is uh, uh, Kristen Catherine Rush. Uh, her blog is chriswrites.com with a K. And uh, she's doing a series, a nine-part series on marketing. She's one of the smartest, most experienced, and generous bloggers I know about in this space. I follow her religiously. She does one post every Thursday on the business of book, uh, of, of being a, a self-published author or being an author. And uh, she recently posted in her marketing series that um, she's looking at some of her books that are 10 or 12 years old, and she's looking at the covers. And the covers uh, for, her, for some of her romance books her covers are not up to current standards. There's not enough bare-chested men and, and low-cleavage women on the front covers of her romances book. They're very chaste-looking because they kind of fit the mood of 10, 15 years ago. She's going to go and redo all of her covers so she can keep her books fresh. She can keep them in the market. They're still a great story. Uh, they're still contemporary enough. They still use the language in the same way that we do uh, uh, now. All she needs is to freshen up her covers, and she thinks that she can continue selling those and, uh, and making money from them. So we've come for full circle now. Uh, final recommendations. This is where we got started. You know, I, I would ask you to take some of the things that we've talked about and critically look at your books and think about, is this book actually going to sell? How many copies can I sell? And if I spend $1,000 getting it to market or $5,000 getting it to market or $3,000 or $7,000, how many books do I have to sell? What's, the, what's, the, what's my break-even? And is it possible with this book, with this story? Make a plan to hit those milestones, to hit those goals, to hit those sales targets, to keep those costs low. You know, talk about uh, or, or put in writing and evaluate you know, what you're going to do and when you're going to do it. And when you go to produce your book, understand that you're competing against uh, uh, professional books getting dumped on the market every single day. And by the way, those professionally, those 1,500 professionally produced books from traditional publishers, you know, most of them are probably from the, uh, from the big five now, big five publishers, but there's t literally 20,000 other publishers in the United States who are also bringing books to market every single day. They're all doing a high uh, level, a high professional level of quality on the books that they bring to market and you're competing against them. You've got to remember that. So when you produce your book, produce it at a high level of quality. And again, as we said right here, right here at the end, monitor what you're doing. What's working? Do more of it. What's not working? Do less of it. But monitor and adjust your results in the marketplace. Play with your pricing. Play with your book description. Continue to work on getting the social proof and the reviews required. You know, I tell all the authors I'm working with, if you don't have a dozen reviews, you have to keep trying. If you've got two dozen reviews, you can stop trying. You should know that when you get to 100 reviews, something kicks in in the Amazon engine, and you're going to start getting referrals. The If you bought this, you might like that. Um, that's going to start to pop up more if your book's got more than 100 reviews. So there's three milestones for you to shoot for. A dozen reviews, two dozen reviews, 100 reviews um, uh, uh, to help you uh, uh, have sales success with your book. I mentioned a couple of other resources I, I, I suggested, I was going to suggest that you look at. Um, these aren't maybe directly applicable. Maybe Dean Wesley Smith is probably the one that's most applicable. Um, Dean Wesley Smith is actually married uh, to Kristen Catherine Rush, and um, they formed a publishing company called WMG. I think they've got 100 books in it or 400 books in it, and they're going gangbusters. And uh, they both are so generous with their time and their expertise in their blogs. They are sharing the how-to best practices in the self-publishing industry like no other writing pair that I know of. Dean Wesley Smith has, I just search, search the internet or search his blog for Think Like a Publisher. I think there are five installments, uh, and it's pretty good. 
Jane Friedman also has a great blog. Uh, she's got how to write a book proposal. Now, how to write a book proposal is especially helpful if you're going to go try and find an agent and query, and you're going to go to a publisher. But I point this out to you because if you read, if you spend 45 minutes reading a few sample proposals and 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 what smart people like Jane have to say about how to write a book proposal, it's going to put you in the mindset of a publisher. It's gonna it's gonna cause you to think critically about your efforts on this book your efforts as a publisher, what it's going to take. And of course, you can always just do an internet search, Google or somebody or Bing or whatever on sample book proposal. There's plenty of them out there. Uh, there's plenty of completed ones. There's plenty of empty ones. Take a look. So I'll take now a moment to pause. And if anybody's got any questions, go ahead and throw them up in the question box. I would be happy to answer them. I'm also going to just sort of flip one little poll out here. I'd like to ask you if I can about how you heard about today's webinar. We're trying to figure out, as I mentioned before, monitor and adjust, monitor and adjust. We're trying to figure out which of our marketing efforts for building attendance these webinars are valuable and which ones are not, which one we should, we should stop doing. So if you would, just take a moment with your mouse, click on one of those radio buttons, and vote for me. Uh, meaning, if you would, tell me, how'd you hear about tonight's webinar? Um, we think that most people heard about it probably through our email, maybe a few people on Facebook. But I'd love to know if there's anything else that's working out there. All right, I've got everybody who's voted, almost everybody. I'm going to go ahead and close the poll, and then I'll share it just so you can see what everybody said. So it looked like we had uh, one referral and 25% um, uh, uh, referral, and 75% uh, were from our WaveCloud email. So that's great to know about. I'll hide that again so you can see the last slide. Again, if you've got any questions, feel free to post them up in the question screen or email me afterwards if you want. I'm happy to help you. Um, if, you've got, uh, if you need any help getting your book to market, WaveCloud does lots of great things for authors and we're happy to talk to you about it. Um, we're different from everybody else because when you work with us, we are strictly work for hire. We're not taking percentages or ownership of your copyright and when we do stuff for you, we give you back all the files because you paid for them and you own them. So again, thanks for joining me tonight, everybody. I really appreciate it. Uh, and I appreciate your early feedback to let me know that you can hear me. That was very helpful. And I wish everybody a great night. Thanks again for joining me. Good night.